In this episode of Tech Effect, how our energy choices affect the future. An aircraft powered by the sun, a plant whisperer who uses technology to grow tomatoes, and travel via Hyperloop moves a step closer. The greatest technological challenge of our time is the fight to protect our planet from the effects of global heating. Most scientists agree that a reliance on fossil fuels has changed the Earth's climate for the worse. And as temperatures rise, so do the threats to human existence. One of the biggest problems is the effect melting polar ice is having on our oceans. As the ice melts, sea levels rise threatening low-lying islands and causing damaging floods. Sea levels are currently rising at a rate of 3.6 centimetres a decade. And every centimetre rise puts another 3 million people at risk of annual coastal flooding. So the European Space Agency is looking to the heavens for help. The ESA has launched the Copernicus Sentinel-6 satellite to provide accurate, reliable long-term observations of sea level rise. After a former NASA scientist, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich is the first of two satellites to be launched. Sentinel-6B is scheduled to start its mission in five years' time. Sea level is uh, a very direct symptom of global warming, so it's very important to measure it accurately and sea level increase is related to the melting of ice, of, of, the, of the poles. It's also related to the accumulation of heat in the oceans. So uh, these two elements together make uh, uh, the, the product of Sentinel-6 very relevant for, for the society. As well as mapping the height of the sea surface, the satellite's data can also be used to measure waves. This will be particularly useful for understanding storm surges, a type of flooding that can overcome coastal defences and cause catastrophic damage. The Sentinel-6 satellites join a family of sentinels in the sky, all focused on our planet's seas. Europe uh, today really has a leadership in uh, Earth observation and it has the largest Earth observation program in the world uh, with uh, all the satellites which we are developing. There are three series. There's the Earth Explorers, which are the science missions, the Copernicus missions, the Sentinels, and the meteorological missions. And the totality of those missions, together with national missions uh, in the various uh, member states of ESA, are today the biggest Earth observation capacity in the world. More than 600 million people live on land that is less than 10 meters above sea level. So it's vital that we find solutions to the problem of increasing ocean levels. One of the key defenses humanity has against global heating is the development of sustainable energy sources. The fossil fuels we currently rely on pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, accelerating climate change and contributing to extreme weather events. Many scientists and futurists believe that the development of sustainable power options will fuel a new industrial revolution. So what are some of the alternative energy sources in the pipeline? Hydrogen is a low emission fuel that's catching on around the world, especially when it's sourced from renewable options. Just like gas, it's possible to set up hydrogen tanks to use for car refueling. The difference is that hydrogen power can be produced by using solar or wind power, rather than fossil fuels. And hydrogen's not the only option for car makers looking for sustainable fuels. Water management company Aquilia has teamed up with SEAT to turn wastewater into fuel. This solves two environmental challenges conserving precious water resources and finding alternative energies that reduce pollution. The production and consumption of this new biofuel reduces CO2 emissions by 80% compared to petrol-powered vehicles. This renewable biofuel can be used to power compressed natural gas cars. 
But how do we turn wastewater into biomethane? In the treatment plants, a physical decanting process in tanks separates the water from the sludge, which is then converted into gas following a fermentation treatment. After a process of purification and enrichment, the biogas is ready to be used as fuel. A car can drive nearly 5 million kilometers with the biofuel obtained from the water used by 50,000 inhabitants and treated in a year in a mid-sized treatment plant. In other words, it could circle the globe 100 times and make six return trips to the moon. Every day, a medium-sized plant can treat around 10,000 cubic meters of water and generate 1,000 cubic meters of biomethane, enough for more than 150 vehicles to drive 100 kilometers per day. Another renewable energy source is transforming our world in surprising ways. While we are familiar with the use of solar power in homes and industry, you may not be aware that even aircraft are harnessing the rays of the sun. To test the potential of solar aviation, the revolutionary Solar Impulse aircraft circumnavigated the globe with adventurers André Borschberg and Bertrand Picard at the controls. The record flight would not have been possible without the help of a mission control based in Monaco. Really, during the flights, we are monitoring the flight. We will help the pilot. We will give him updates. Oh, here maybe the, the wind changed, so we suggest you go here, you go here. In the plane, we have only one pilot. And the second pilot, or the first officer, or the co-pilot, is this area here. Our partners, they don't come from the world of aviation. They come from the world of industry. And the technologies they provide to us are the ones they put on the market. The Solar Impulse is currently being converted into an unmanned aircraft for US startup Skydweller Aero. It demonstrates that solar power has the capacity to meet many of our future energy needs as we search for clean alternatives that won't cost the Earth. Still to come, high-tech mapping joins the fight against floods. When it comes to making our everyday more sustainable, there are many technologies in development that will reduce our carbon footprint in unexpected ways. Spanish auto manufacturer Seat has created a 3D printing lab that enables it to create parts without molds, with no design limitations. 80% of the pieces we make are development prototype parts. But more and more, we're making tools that can be used for the vehicle assembly process. We're also creating pieces for different uses. We've been making face masks for people who are uncomfortable with surgical masks, or even hands-free door opener accessories that can be used with your forearm. 3D printing can provide parts up to 10 times faster than other types of manufacture. Our design and development colleagues benefit from the advantage of having parts immediately because when they're working on a new model, they can have different versions very quickly and can make changes, if necessary, in the final version. 3D printing makes it possible to create parts on the spot rather than shipping them across the world. In the future, we want to use the technology to make both customized parts for clients as well as accessories. In a different field, Japanese farmer Tadashi Fukuoka is using futuristic technology to protect his beloved tomato plants. Tadashi is still a hands-on farmer, but thanks to a sensor system developed by Bosch, He's able to access highly accurate data from the environment, such as temperature, humidity, and CO2. This alerts him instantly to infection risks and reduces the need for pesticides by up to 50%, a 
saving for both his wallet and the environment. The Plantec system was specially designed for Japanese farmers, as most farms in Japan are small, family-owned operations. Using technology to create personalized solutions is a concern in the fashion industry too. Designers are looking for ways they can connect with customers by providing them with unique products created in a sustainable way. Co-founder of Fashion for Good, William McDonough, is passionate about creating products that benefit people and the earth. Fashion is by definition the making of things. And fashion as it transforms with culture is by definition innovation. So it's the making of things and innovation at its core. Fashion for Good supporter Leslie Johnston is focused on identifying existing innovations that can be applied today. Innovation is really important for transforming the global apparel industry, but in our view, it's not about creating more innovation, it's about taking the innovations that are out there, scaling them up and embedding them in the industry. There's no shortage of incredible ideas and new ways of doing things, but where there is a shortage is how you get those to scale. And that's really the core of what Fashion for Good is doing, is trying to find, support, scale up, and embed those innovations in the supply chain so it could really transform the way that our clothes are made. The company is keen to get the fashion industry involved in a process that would see designers create an item of clothing that could be endlessly recycled, resulting in zero waste. McDonough sees fashion as the perfect fit for this framework. Textile innovation is fantastic because it's a three-dimensional event. It's about weaving stories together as well as materials. Every thread is a thread of a story. Every story has threads. So textile innovation is stories of human production, it's science, it's culture, it's art, it's relationships of people to the planet, it's agriculture, it's technology, the textile is the fabric of life itself. One of the benefits of space travel is the ability to view the Earth from a new perspective. Our globe has never looked more fragile than when seen at a distance. The launch of satellites that allow ultra-high resolution imagery and mapping is benefiting many fields of endeavor that help protect the planet. One of these is a project from Google that uses artificial intelligence to provide better warning for floods. Scientists feed information such as historical events, river level readings, terrain and elevation into their models to generate maps and run simulations at each location. From this, they have created river flood forecasting models that can more accurately predict not only when and where a flood might occur, but the severity of the event as well. Google already issues alerts about natural disasters through the Google Public Alert program, but this initiative takes it a step further. The company has partnered with India's Central Water Commission to obtain the data needed to roll out early flood warnings, starting with the Patna region. The response time is most crucial thing. Reducing the response time always plays a very important and vital role in the whole disaster management framework. Advancement in technology would help us better in spreading this message faster. Flood forecasting was a very exploratory project. The big technical question was, can we have enough information to try to do forecasting that would be accurate enough to make a difference? Starting with the basic needs for getting information about what's going on, where is it happening, what should I be doing? As more people are killed by flooding in India than anywhere else in the world, Using AI to develop more precise warnings will be a lifesaver. To develop an accurate flood forecast, scientists begin by collecting thousands of satellite images to build a digital model of the terrain. Based on these maps, they generate hundreds of thousands of simulations of how the river could possibly behave. 
They can then send those forecasts to individuals using search, maps and Android notifications. This is an example of an alert that we can produce. This alert is for Patna. This alert is actually has over 90% accuracy. The researchers have also found it vital to talk to people who have experienced severe floods to see what they find important. Eventually, the technology developed for Patna will be rolled out to other places around the world, with the aim to give people three to four days warning of floods coming to their area. Still to come, Hyperloop's wild ride. It's the most popular food on the planet, the basis of world famous dishes, and now its husk can be part of a car. We're talking about rice. As an innovative pilot project based on the circular economy and with the goal of reducing its carbon footprint, SEAT is researching the use of orozite as a substitute for plastic products. More than 700 million tons of rice is harvested each year. 20% of this is rice husks, some 140 million tons, which is usually thrown away. Now scientists have found a use for those husks by turning them into orizite, a product that can be mixed with other heat-stable thermoplastic compounds and molded. As well as car parts, there are many applications for recycled rice husks. They can be used to create furniture, buttons, clothes hangers and cosmetic containers, products that are currently made using petroleum-based plastics. Orizite does not ignite easily and has a low moisture absorption. It also has a unique look and feel. Sayat has trialed rice husks mixed with synthetic materials in parts of a car, such as the rear hatch, the double load floor of the boot, and the ceiling headliner. At first glance, they look exactly the same as car parts made with conventional technology, but they weigh much less. This lessens the weight of the car, reducing its carbon footprint. Innovations such as this are vital in redefining our transport options. When combined with battery technology, it will result in fewer emissions and more livable cities. But as we ride into the future, experts warn there is still much to be done. The most important thing is that we have to decarbonize mobility because we have not been making progress in this field. No? We are making progress in energy, we are making progress in buildings, we are making progress in the industries. In, in mobility we don't and we need to do so. Now we'll be talking about electrification and decarbonization of cars, but beyond that I would like to combine this with livable cities. No? So livable cities, people-centered cities and better mobility is what I'm interested in. One of Tesla's visions for better mobility involves a fully electric utility. The futuristic Cybertruck is a battery-powered light-duty vehicle that will have an estimated 400 to 800 kilometer range, depending on the model. Tesla founder Elon Musk is also keen to develop an amphibious version of the truck. Designed specifically for dry land, Rinspeed and Harman's latest concept car showcases the connected, semi-autonomous vehicle at its most advanced. The Rinspeed Oasis is a maneuverable speedster with an integrated small garden plot behind the windshield. With its finger on the pulse of the social web, the Oasis works out its own route based on traffic conditions while its slightly curved 5K windscreen display presents information as required. This next-gen car can think for itself, leaving its occupants plenty of time to focus on other things. Like the head-up display on an aircraft, the Oasis projects important information onto the windscreen by using holographic laser projection. Tired of driving? 
the steering wheel folds flat and turns into a keyboard or work surface. This turns the car into a self-driving office on wheels, complete with office productivity software and Skype video telephony with live translation. The personal assistant not only knows who's talking, but also the language they're speaking. Electric car users know the frustration of running out of battery. The Oasis automatically coordinates with a robot bearing a replacement battery. Simply swap over the power banks and you're back on the road. The compact car uses different sensors based on NXP technology to capture a 360-degree view of its surroundings with pinpoint precision. It will happily park itself and wait to be recalled by your phone. British company Virgin's concept of a better mobility involves a pod propelled at speeds of over a thousand kilometers an hour via an underground tunnel. While other companies are working on similar technology, the Virgin Hyperloop is the first to successfully send passengers on a test trip. Virgin boasts that the Hyperloop will deliver airline speeds, the same g-forces as rail and the ease of riding a metro. Instead of a timetable, pods will leave on command and won't need to stop at every station. Each pod can be configured to carry up to 28 passengers and light luggage. At the DevLoop site in Nevada, the Hyperloop has been run through more than 400 tests for aerodynamics and safety. The DevLoop test track is 500 meters long and 3.3 meters in diameter. The Hyperloop pod is able to reach high speeds because it is placed in a tunnel that acts as a pressurized tube. Once the tunnel is sealed, most of the air is sucked out to reduce resistance. The pod is then pulled forward by a chain of magnets placed along the tunnel, reaching transonic speeds of more than a thousand kilometers an hour. All right, team, please confirm you're ready. 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 Prepare for launch in five, four, three, two, one. Launch. Virgin employees Josh Geigel and Sarah Lucian recently became the first people to travel in the Virgin Hyperloop. While some scientists doubt the technology will ever be commercially feasible, Virgin is pressing on with plans to build a $15 billion Texan Hyperloop. The biggest concerns include the difficulty of maintaining a vacuum in a tunnel hundreds of kilometers long. Some experts worry that earth tremors or other unforeseen disruptions could lead to a catastrophic accident. But Virgin's engineers are confident they can overcome these obstacles and are working hard to scale up their test models. It won't be long before we'll know whether our future involves transonic travel in a tube. The Tech Effect shows us how we can unlock tomorrow today.